So we continue to work in uh, rigid body kinematics. Uh, we're doing this in uh, two dimensions. The mechanicals will probably go on to an advanced class where they'll do this in three dimensions, but we're mainly uh, doing uh, plane kinetics. And uh, we've used the equation uh, quite a bit that force is equal to mass times acceleration. That's fairly easy to use. We've got a lot of practice with that with the kinetics of a uh, particle. And then we went to rigid body uh, kinetics. We had the new equation that sum of the moments is equal to I times alpha, where I is the mass moment of inertia. And we talked the last couple times about that I and coming up with that I. This equation, we need to probably do some more work on this because when you start looking at the moment and things rotating and whatnot, uh, the point, what point is it, or the, the question, what point is it rotating about becomes fairly important. While alpha or omega might be the same at every point, uh, I is certainly not the same at every point, uh, depending on, on what axis you're rotating this thing about. So we actually have uh, three equations. We have uh, these three equations that we can use that I could expand this. And your author does a great job of uh, developing this. I'm not going to go through that. I'll refer you to your author. Uh, but we have these equations where if you sum the moment about the mass center, so G is the mass center, the sum of the moment about the mass center is equal to I about that same mass center times the angular acceleration alpha. Or if you want to sum the moment about a point other than the mass center, you have a couple more options. You could say that the moment about point O, and point O is any point, the moment about point O is equal to I about O times alpha. And this has a restriction that O must be fixed. And when we say fixed, uh, not accelerating. Okay, It can be fixed and not moving at all, or it can be moving in a straight line with constant velocity, but it cannot be accelerating. That's what we mean by fixed. So if O is not fixed, if it's bolted to a building and we're not thinking about the building moving or something like that, that's a great equation. Uh, what happens if neither one of these work? That we don't want to sum the moment about the mass center and the point that we're interested in summing the moment about actually happens to be accelerating. But we have to use the third and more general equation is that the moment about any point is equal to I about the mass center times alpha. So we see that from the first equation. And then we have to account for the mass center accelerating. So I have to add this term, the mass, times the acceleration of the mass center times the distance, the perpendicular distance between the point P and the mass center. Okay. Obviously, if we can try and use these uh, first two equations, life's probably a little easier for us, but uh, uh, we may have to use that equation before we're all done. So there's the three possible equations. You can work some problems with um, multiple different equations. Obviously, if we could work it with this first one, we probably wouldn't, wouldn't want to choose the third one, although if we are careful, we should get the same answer with either one. Questions of that? Well, let's uh, move right on to an example then. And I put quite a bit of verbiage here, again, not because I like writing this stuff out, but because I think it's important for us to sort out what, what that all means. So we've got a, a trailer here. Presumably it's hooked to a, a car. A few things about this. I guess we need a fender here. This looks a little sloppy. There, we've got a fender now. Um, so... We're told the mass center of this thing is right above the axle. That may not be the best place to put it, but uh, for this problem, it's above the axle. It's located 0.9 meters above the road surface. Uh, it's uh, the, the trailer and the load, the, the entire mass center is, is uh, 900 kilograms. And we're told the hitch is 0.5 meters above the, the surface of the road there. And the distance from the center of the axle up to where the hitch is at point A is 1.2 meters. So those, those are our dimensions. And what we've got is we've got this trailer hooked to a car, and we're told the car and the trailer, so they're together at the end of this experiment, that's good. The car and the trailer reach a velocity of 60 kilometers per hour on a level road in 30 meters from rest with constant acceleration. So it's uh, stopped at a uh, stoplight or stop sign or something like that. On a level road with constant acceleration in 30 meters, they get uh, 60 kilometers per hour. It's probably a pretty decent acceleration, particularly with a trailer, but anyway. We'd like to find the vertical force at A, neglecting the small friction force exerted on the relatively light wheels. Okay, Neglecting the small friction force. So that means that we can neglect rolling resistance, right? And then what's this business about exerted on relatively light wheels? Well, what that means is that I, for the wheel, and maybe we should say wheel and tire, but I for the wheel and tire, if it's relatively light, 
we don't like to say wheels and tires have no mass, but if it's relatively light, it has pretty pretty small mass, right? About zero, right? So if it has zero mass, what could we say that I is? About zero. So I'm not going to have to concern myself with the rotational effects of those wheels. So I'm not going to worry about the friction force on the wheels, and I'm not going to worry about the fact that the wheels are are rotating. Okay, so there's there's a couple of things to think about. Let me see if I can get a handle on this acceleration. We're told that the car and the trailer reach 60 miles per hour on a level road in 30 meters with constant acceleration. So we'll go back to um, V dV is equal to A dS. It's like that's how we started the uh, the term. And uh, you could come up with your kinematics equations. We could. Uh, one of them was that the final velocity is equal to the square root of 2 times a times s if a is constant, which uh, we're told that the acceleration is constant. So we've got that equation. And putting the values in there, we would have to um, put this in here. We'd uh, do, what, 60 kilometers per hour. So what would I have to multiply that by to get uh, meters per second? Be a 1,000 uh, and then 3,600 is equal to the square root of 2 times a times then we had uh, 30 meters. So getting consistent units you've got something like that. The acceleration then turns out to be 4.63 meters per second squared which is what about uh, half a g which is pretty decent acceleration with a trailer but uh, anyway. So we've got the acceleration there. We have to be careful with units but we got the acceleration. And that was a nice trip back into kinematics. But now we need to uh, concentrate on the kinetics. And anytime you hear about kinetics, what should you probably be thinking? Free body diagram, right? Well, some people might be thinking I need to go to another question on the final. But I mean, the free body diagram is probably what you should be thinking about. Let's, so let's see if we can tackle a free body diagram here. So I've got something like that. I'm just going to look at the free body diagram of the entire trailer. And we probably have some normal force. Okay, the wheels of the trailer sitting on the ground. And we probably uh, have some weight, mg, acting down, right? And we're trying to accelerate this trailer, so we'll definitely have some force in the x direction. Right? And then uh, we might say, well, there's a uh, force that's going to be in this direction. And I'm actually going to put that uh, force down. If, if I'm wrong, we just get a negative sign. If I'm uh, right, I guess we can talk about that. I, I think I'll probably be right. Because if you look at this, this uh, weight, this mass up here is going to resist velocity changes. So that's actually going to tend to try and lag behind, isn't it? That's actually going to try and pop this. Uh, pull that hitch up. Okay, so I think this force will actually be down. Nothing to uh, get too concerned about. Again, if I'm uh, wrong, we just get a negative sign. So let's see, where's a good point to sum the moment about? What about this point right here? That would be that point essentially right there, wouldn't it? I'm going to call that O. So that's O. And I could sum the moment about there. Okay, so I'm going to sum the moment about O. And is O accelerating? Yeah. Yeah, the whole thing's accelerating. So O is accelerating. So if I go back and I look at how we started today, we, we can't use this one. That's not a keeper. O is accelerating so that we can't use that one. So we're, we're stuck at this one, aren't we? Okay, so let's look at that. So I'm going to have uh, I about the mass center times alpha plus the mass times the acceleration of the mass center times the distance. Okay. Now the question might be, well, well why did you decide to sum the moment about O? Well, O makes a lot of sense because Fx intersects that point. I don't know Fx nor am I looking for fx. 
I don't know the normal force, nor am I looking for the normal force. I do happen to know mg, so that wouldn't be a big deal. So it should give me a nice equation where I can find this Fy. That's what I'm looking for, right? Okay. Now, unfortunately, because I'm summing about oh, I'm kind of stuck with this ugly equation here, but I don't think that it's going to be as bad as we might think because this term actually goes to zero. Why does that go to zero? Because does it actually rotate? We talk about it being on the verge of rotating. If someone didn't hook the hitch up right, it might try and rotate, but does it actually rotate? No, it doesn't. Okay, it's only on the verge of rotation. It's actually not rotating. Alpha is actually equal to zero, isn't it? So that's good because I didn't want to really have to find out what I for this whole mess uh, trailer is. You know, if someone comes along and dents the fender, then it changes my I value and whatnot. Um, so this should be a little easier not having to deal with that. So let me go ahead and take uh, clockwise as positive. I'll need to observe that sign convention on both sides of that equal sign. So I can say that I have then Fy, that's that force there, times the distance that that acts through, which is 1.2 right up there and that's going to be equal to zero plus what's our mass 900 kilograms if we're working in the English system you're probably given it in pounds so you would have to divide that by 32.2 so be real careful with that but we've got mass there times what's the acceleration of the mass center 4.63 that's what we found there good 4.63 and then what's the distance d between those? So we're looking at, oh, we need to find this distance here, don't we? So what's that going to be? 0 0.9 minus 0.5, isn't it? Okay. Now is that positive? Yeah, because the direction of this, it is also positive, isn't it? So I have to observe this sign convention on both sides of that equal sign. When you go through the solution here, you'll find that Fy is equal to, make sure I got this right here, yeah, 1389 newtons. Okay, 1389 newtons. So actually I was correct, that force has to be exerted down because that mass really wants to lag behind and because of that, the uh, car would tend to pull the trailer out from under the mass and the uh, if this wasn't hitched up properly it would rotate around. And this isn't something that just civil engine or that uh, mechanical uh, engineers get into. I guess we need a page, uh, we haven't done this for a while, 2.1. So in looking at this if we uh, Think about uh, civil engineers, structural engineers in doing a building. So we have this uh, building here and it probably has some mass center. And we look at the earth accelerating. The earth could acceler accelerate in a variety of directions. So let's take that the earth is going to accelerate that way. So what's going to happen to this building? This mass center lags behind, doesn't it? Doesn't want to keep up, doesn't want to stay with the program. So it's like that. And that's what we have, right? And that's what destroys a building. And then you look at the download here. So now all of a sudden you have this uh, weight that was here going right down the wall into the foundation. That works pretty well. Now we have this weight and our foundation is over here. And there's some distance here. We will call that delta. And they will talk about P delta because they named their weight P. So they will talk about P delta. As delta gets very large, that will destroy a building pretty quick. Okay. So this notion of this uh, mass lagging behind hopefully makes sense in this problem that uh, this has some uplift on the hitch, but we also see it again, the structurals will see it again a lot when you look at the uh, mass lagging behind in an earthquake situation. And this is where then uh, with tall structures, sophisticated structures, you're not going to do it on a, uh, only a few million dollar structure, but when you, you start looking at very uh, large sophisticated structures, They'll put a mass up here, a mass dampen system, and try and get that mass moving in the other direction to counteract this. So. Questions with that? This is probably one of the reasons that they usually recommend you don't put the mass center right over the axle. Usually you want to try and move this forward just a little bit, give you some tongue weight.
another good reason for that. And probably not driving like a crazy person would uh, would help here too, right? Okay. I think I said uh, as we began the term that uh, 60 miles an hour is 88 feet per second. So be careful as you're out there driving around, right? Things happen real fast. So I drove to Portland a couple weeks ago. And I think almost everyone that I saw was texting in their car, which is just just crazy if you ask me. But uh, anyway, any questions of that? Well, let's try another problem then. So we've got uh, this problem here. We've got some sort of a pendulum. So we've got a pendulum at O. It's uh, swinging down like this. We're told the mass is 7.5 kilograms, so that's not a really big pendulum like you might have in the pit in the pendulum. Do they still have you read that story in high school? Do they have you read any Edgar Allan Poe in high school? He's, he really wasn't right, was he? Very interesting. So I mean, he's got poems out there that rhyme both ways. If you read them up and down, kind of an interesting bird. So, but yeah, I mean, if you want to think of this, uh, spice this up, thinking about the pit and the pendulum here, you can uh, you can do that. So we've got uh, 7.5 kilograms. The radius of gyration is 295 millimeters, and we're told it's released from rest at theta equals zero degrees. So it's brought up here. Uh, horizontal, it's released from rest, and we like to find the bearing reactions at O, so there's a nice bearing at O. We're going to think of it as virtually a frictionless bearing. We'd like to find the reactions in that bearing when theta is equal to 60 degrees. So let's see if we can work our way through there. The first thing is probably to deal with this, the radius of gyration, and remember that I about O would be equal to the radius of gyration about O squared times the mass, right? Because the radius of gyration, k about O, would be equal to the square root of I about O divided by the mass. We saw that as we were finishing up last time. So we'll use that. We could, uh, well, I, I, we'll, we'll just leave that like that. So we've got that. We've got the, uh, the mass. Let's draw a free body diagram for this thing. Maybe I'll put that over here. So we've got the uh, bearing reactions. Something like this here, and I'm probably going to have some some weight. This would be the mass center of mass here. So there's the weight acting to the center of the Earth, and we probably have some reactions here. I could say that this is the reaction at O in the tangential direction, and I might say that it would have the reaction at O in the normal direction, like that. I could say that this probably has some what? It's going to swing down. It's going to have some uh, alpha and some omega. Okay. So let's see if we could do that. What, what equation should we use? I mean, we're, we're going back to really the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration, and the sum of the moments is equal to I alpha. And we have to be, maybe we should be uh, put a little uh, star there. Got to be careful with that thing, right? Because there's several of those. Could I use this one? I mean, if this is point O, if that's point O, would it make sense to sum the moment about O, setting it to I about O times alpha? We have I about O via the radius of gyration, don't we? So that might work. What was the stipulation on that equation? Yeah, O is not accelerating. Is O accelerating? Doesn't appear to be. This is probably fixed to, to the building. We're going to go with the pet pit and the pendulum, you know, some old haunted house or something. It's fixed to that. We'll assume that it's not during an earthquake or something like that. So we're going to say that O is fixed. Well, let's say that's fixed and we can use that equation. So let's see, what, what moments do we have about O? Why don't I take clockwise as positive and see if we can work our way through this. If I were to look at O here, those forces, O sub T and O sub N, intersect it, so it's not going to create a moment. So really I'm just looking at MG, right? And MG has a, a couple pieces. It has a component like this that's going to intersect that. And then this piece here, that's going to be 
more important, isn't it? And that's actually going to be M, which is 7.5 times uh, 9.81. So that's Mg. And then I have uh, what? The uh, cosine of theta. So I have to break that up. The cosine of theta. And what distance is it acting through? Right here. There's the R distance. So I think I'll say, I think I'm going to use uh, meters. So I'll just say that's 0.25 meters. So I'll put 0.25 there. Okay. And I think I'll leave that cosine theta. You, you agree that that's, uh, if this is uh, theta, yeah, then we'd have this up here, yeah. So we're good with cosine theta. I think those are the only forces. So I could say that this was then I about O. What's I about O? K squared times the mass, isn't it? So let's see, K is uh, 295 millimeters. I could say that that was 295 divided by 1,000, 0.295 meters. So I'm going to have 0.295 and I'll square that. It's going to be in meters. And then what's the mass on this thing? 7.5. Okay, so there's the I term. And we're multiplying that by what? Alpha. Okay. So there's my equation. I have two unknowns, but that shouldn't be a problem because I really want to relate theta, uh, alpha and theta. So I'm going to say that alpha, solving for alpha, turns out to be equal to 28.2 times the cosine of theta. Okay. So if I go back to our equation, I, um, we could say omega d omega was equal to alpha d theta. Is that fair? I mean, that was like our, our friend, I think we used it today, VDV is equal to ADS, isn't it? So, I mean, that, that's fair game. So, if I integrate this thing, I could say the integral of this and the integral of this. So, I've got the integral from 0 to omega of omega d omega is equal to the integral. What's 60 degrees? That's equal to what? In radians, that's going to be pi over 3. Good. So I get 0 to pi over 3. And then I'm going to make my substitution for alpha. So I'll put alpha right in there. I'm going to have 28.2 times the cosine of theta d theta. That was a fortunate substitution. So I can solve this for omega squared. I mean, I could solve for omega, but I think eventually we'll need omega squared. So I'm just going to leave it as omega squared. Solving for omega squared, I get 48.8. Okay, and that would be radians per second, and the whole thing squared. Radians per second, and the whole thing squared because it's omega squared. So 48.8. So that was one equation. I haven't got the problem solved. I'm, I'm looking for those, those forces. So what would be a, a next good step? Well, we've, we've used this one, haven't we? Have we used this one? There's actually two of them there, some of the force in the x and some of the force in the y. So let's see if we can do that. Um, maybe I won't break it up as x and y. Maybe I'll break it up as normal and tangential. So if I sum the forces in the normal direction, setting it to mass times acceleration in the normal direction, and we could say that the normal direction, we'll just take that as that direction being positive, that that's the normal direction. Okay. So what forces do I have there? O sub n, that's the reaction at the bearing. That hopefully makes sense. And then, let's see, that's perpendicular to it. This one I have to deal with, don't I? So I'm going to have minus 7.5 times the uh, 9.81 times the sine of 60 degrees. I'm going to start using 60 degrees now. I think I can. 
is equal to the mass, which is 7.5 times, what's the acceleration in the normal direction? Could I say it was r omega squared? Is that fair? I mean, v squared over rho, I don't have v, I have omega squared, so let me say it's r times omega squared. So with that, I'd, what's the r? 0.25, and what's omega squared? That's why I left that as omega squared, because it should work out pretty well, 48.8. Okay. Now, the one thing, again, I have to observe this sign convention on both sides of this equal sign. So I took this O sub n, that's positive. This force here, that's negative. That's why I had a negative sign. How about the acceleration? Is it positive or negative? Normal acceleration should point back to the center, center of curvature, so that should be positive, shouldn't it? So I should be able to solve this for O sub n which turns out to be 155.2 newtons. That worked out pretty well. Well, let's see if we can... We need a page four. Yes, I had four already. No, okay, so... So if I continue on with this, I could say that the sum of the forces in the tangential direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the tangential direction. What's a good way to take the tangential direction? Well, I, could, I guess we could take it uh, this way. I think we're going to end up with a negative sign no matter what. So while I say that this is the normal, I'm going to say that this is the tangential. So when I go through this, what forces do I have in the tangential direction? I've got this uh, O of T that happens to be in the negative tangential direction. And then I have this component of the force there that should be positive, right? So I'm going to have to deal with that one. And I'm going to have to deal with that one. Let's see what that looks like. Minus O of T plus uh, 7.5 times 9.81 times the cosine of 60 is equal to the mass, which is 7.5. And then what's the tangential acceleration going to be? Yeah, r times alpha, right? Okay. So... What R do we have? 0.25 and alpha. Do I have alpha? Yeah, there's alpha right up there. 28.2 times the cosine of theta. 28.2 times the cosine. And we're doing this at 60 degrees, so we have... That's our theta. So we can go through the solution here. O of T, that turns out to be equal to 10.3. Newtons. So it's kind of interesting. The normal uh, force is a lot larger than the tangential. But if you wanted to, then you could resolve these. I mean, going back to what we have as a picture of this thing, we had this. The tangential was uh, 10.3. We had that the normal was much larger, 155. You could uh, resolve these, couldn't you? And come up with the result. So someone wanting to design that bearing and whatnot, they would be interested in that. Questions of that? No questions? So it's just a matter of going back and using our equations. We used the moment equation, then we used the uh, force equation. When you come up with a the direction that you're going to take is positive, you have to observe that direction on both sides of the equal sign. Well, let's tackle one more problem for the day. So this will be page five. 
So let's say we have some sort of a uh, hoisting mechanism. We have this uh, motor and we've got a, a belt or chain that's running around the motor and going around this thing. And this um, motor is putting a constant 400 pound tension on the top. Uh, this bottom would then be slack. I kind of exaggerated how I drew this, but I think if you remember, I mean, if you look at the bicycle chain on your bicycle, the top is the, the tight side and the bottom's kind of always slack, isn't it? Okay. Uh, so same situation here. The top is tight, the bottom slack. So we can uh, virtually ignore this bottom because it's, it's slack. Um, it's driving this large 24-inch uh, radius uh, gear or uh, sprocket or pulley or sheave. And then we've got this cable that's wrapping around the uh, winch drum, and it has a radius of 12 inches. This uh, drum and pulley arrangement is 322 pounds. It's on a bearing at O. We're told this whole thing has a radius of gyration of 18 inches, and we're using it to, to hoist a load of 644 pounds. And this belt's making an angle here with the horizontal of 45 degrees. So what we'd like to find is we'd like to find the acceleration of the load and the bearing reaction. So we'd like to find out how fast that load's accelerating up and what reactions we have at the bearing there. So what's a good way to start this problem? It's what kind of problem? Kinetics? How do we always start a kinetics problem? Free body diagram. Okay, so I'm going to draw a free body diagram of the uh, drum and pulley arrangement. So I have something like this where I have this uh, 400 pounds at an angle of 45 degrees. I flipped that angle, but since it's 45, that'll be okay. At O here, what am I going to say that I have at O? Probably this, uh, I'll say that I have an OX. And I'll say that I have an OY. And again, if I assume those in the wrong direction, I only get a negative sign. Does this thing have some weight? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely has some weight. We're told it's 322 pounds. Anything else? I've got the bearing reactions. I've got the weight. I've got this uh, tension on the top. This is slack on the bottom, so I don't have to worry about that. Anything else? Yeah, this uh, cable here. And I might be tempted to say that that's 644 pounds, but if we're accelerating that, it's probably something different. So let me say that that's T. And maybe because of that, I should come over and draw a free body diagram of that load. The load here. Because I would have, what, 644 pounds acting down. And I'll probably have some T acting up. Because we're going to assume that this is accelerating up. I'll say that it's accelerating up. And maybe I'll put the alpha on here like that. For it to accelerate up, I'd have to have the alpha going like that. <coughs> well, I'm given the radius of gyration on this thing is 18 inches, so I could say that I about O is equal to K about O squared times the mass. So we would say that this is, what, 18 over 12, because I want to convert to feet. So that's squared. And what's the mass? 322, but that's pounds, isn't it? That's 4, so I'd better divide by 32.2, because you need mass. Okay, which gives me 22.5. That's going to be slugs feet squared. Okay, so 22.5 of those. Well, let's see. I think we need some equations and we could solve this thing, couldn't we? Some of the force, some of the moment, right? What would be a good, I like to do the moment equation first. Could I sum the moment about O, setting it equal to I about O times alpha? Is that fair? What was the stipulation on that equation? O was fixed. O was not accelerating. Is, can we take O as fixed? Yeah. Well, presumably this is uh, hooked to something that's probably not accelerating. Yes? Uh, well, we're taking care of that with the uh, the weight. Yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. We're we're all moving and whatnot, but we're, that's taken care of with the wave. And I mean, the, the the thing like, let's say if this is bolted on the side of a cruise ship, it's probably not accelerating very much. We might be able to get away with ignoring that, right? If it's bolted on the side of a rocket ship, uh, probably not a good approximation. So we have to kind of temper that. Okay, so I think we're okay with that. So let's see if we can do this. What moment are we going to have about, oh, all these forces intersect, so the only thing that I'm going to have to worry about is this 400. So I'll take uh, 400, and what distance is it acting through? Two feet, right? 24 over 12. We'll take clockwise as positive. Then I'm going to have to subtract T. What distance is it acting through? One foot, right? 12 over 12. And that's equal to I about O, which is 22.5 times alpha. Alpha is clockwise, so I've observed the sign convention on both sides there. So that's equation number one. One equation, two unknowns. Well, what do we do? We go write another equation. So let's say the sum of the forces in the vertical direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the vertical direction. So if I look at this one here, what forces do I have in the vertical direction? I'll take positive up. I can say that I have T minus 644 is equal to the mass, which is 644 divided by 32.2. It's got to be mass times acceleration. T is up. Acceleration is up. So that will be a positive term. So there is equation number two. Oh, I have yet another unknown. Two equations, three unknowns. What do I need? I need another equation. Well, if we look at this cable as it run, rolls onto this drum, what do we know about the relationship of A and alpha? I could say that the acceleration A is equal to R times alpha, couldn't I? Because really this acceleration here is going to be the tangential acceleration at this point. So that would be my third equation. And we could go through and solve that. So solving those three equations. So I want to solve equation 1, equation 2, and equation 3. And when I do that, I get that the tension T is equal to 717 pounds. We might pause for a little bit. Does that seem right? If it was just hanging static, it would be what? 644. So we're accelerating up, so it should be greater than 644. That's good. Alpha turns out to be 3.67 radians per second squared, which nets us an acceleration A of 3.67 um, feet per second squared. Does that make sense? This R here is what? 12 over 12, which is 1. So that, that should work. We've got a positive alpha. We've got a positive acceleration. So that uh, corresponds with this. So I think we're good. Now, have I answered the problem? I'd like to find the acceleration of the load right there. We've got the acceleration of the load. The other thing that I wanted to find is I wanted to find the bearing reactions. Well, if I go back to this free body diagram, I can come up with those bearing reactions, can't I? So what, what would be my bearing reactions? If I sum the uh, forces in the vertical direction, say equal to mass times acceleration in the vertical direction, for this piece, I mean, we've already used that equation for the load, but we haven't used it for the uh, drum and pulley arrangement. What forces do I have in the vertical direction? OY minus 322 minus T. Is that right? Do I have anything else to subtract? Minus 
400 times the sine of 45 is equal to what? Hopefully zero. Hopefully it's not jumping up and down, right? So we put the tension in here of uh, 717. We should be able to solve for OY as 1322 pounds. If I sum the forces in the uh, horizontal direction, setting up the mass times acceleration in the horizontal direction, what do we have in the horizontal direction? OX minus 400 cosine 45. That's equal to zero. We, we agreed that O was not uh, accelerating. So with that, I can solve for OX, which turns out to be equal to 283 pounds. And again, those numbers become important if you try and design the bearing for that uh, system. Questions with that? So again, it's really about using the equations. The sum of the force is equal to mass times acceleration, and the sum of the moments is equal to I times alpha. And this one's a little bit trickier because you have to be careful what point you're working around, and there's some, some slight deviations if your uh, point is accelerating. But where we'll go next time is we're going to look at this problem. I'll get you thinking about this for a while until we meet again. Kind of a classic problem. You may have done it in physics. If you didn't do it in physics, it may be in your physics textbook. But we're going to take a ring of mass m. So we'll take a ring where all the mass is in the uh, perimeter of this ring. And it's a uh, radius, so that the ring is fairly thin. And we're going to hold it up over here with a string. And we're going to have a, a frictionless bearing here. And we'll let that string break. And we'll talk about what the acceleration is as that flops down. You can imagine that's going to flop down. And what those bearing reactions are. And then we're going to do exactly the same thing for a disk. The disk is going to have a radius r um, and a mass m. So it would seem to be very similar, wouldn't it? But we'll find out that the disk has a different mass moment of inertia than the ring does, and that affects the problem fairly significantly. So that's where we'll go next time. Take care till then. Thank you.